Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, dependable real-time decision making in cyber physical systems. Um, and I'll, uh, this talk is, uh, is about a set of projects, related projects done with several students, postdocs, and collaborators at Berkeley and elsewhere. Um, and all of it is, um, is about this class of systems that we call cyber physical systems. Um, So what are cyber-physical systems? Well, they, these are integrations of computation with the physical world. And there are several examples all around us. Um, automotive systems, avionics, uh, going from large aircraft to little drones, um, uh, power grid, building control systems, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, in this particular talk, I'm going to um, focus uh, mostly on uh, a class of CPS that uh, are often termed safety critical CPS. Um, so these are things where uh, the operation of these systems usually has a component that relates to safety, broadly defined. Um, and so these include uh, systems like autonomous vehicles, um, aircraft of various kinds, even power grid you can imagine has safety critical aspects to it. And uh, Richard Murray actually uh, gave a very, a very nice talk, overview talk about this class of systems and the challenges and open problems uh, around these uh, in the open lecture at the end of January. So those of you who were there, recall uh, the various things that he brought up about these. Um, now, if you think about making these systems dependable, um, this is a problem that you have to address at many layers. Um, and, um, and so one of the things that you might want to do is there may be certain very crucial components of the system that you'd like to design correct by construction. Um, these are things that you might like to write a, a formal mathematical specification of and then derive the implementation from that spec in a manner that preserves a correctness guarantees. So you're able to prove that the system is correct. Um, this is definitely the holy grail, in fact, to design the entire thing, but that's beyond our reach. And today, uh, as Richard mentioned in his talk, you can apply co controller synthesis only to some very small uh, components of the entire CPS. So what to do about the rest? Well, one thing you could do is for certain other parts of the system, you could apply uh, what we call design time verification. So maybe these are designed uh, by programmers working by hand. Uh, you may have third-party components, uh, some of which you may have the source code for, and there are uh, a number of techniques to be able to verify properties of these systems before you deploy them. Still, the state of the art of verification is not at the point where we want it, and so, um, so you need something more. There will always be components today that uh, have not been verified. Now, for these, we need uh, to be able to monitor them at runtime and then build in techniques for error resilience or fault tolerance or maybe attack tolerance at runtime. Um, and so there's a slew of techniques to deal with that. But even so, even runtime monitoring systems may prove inadequate when uh, you don't uh, understand the fault models or the error models or the, the situations that may lead to failure well enough uh, to build in the runtime monitoring at design time. And so you also need to think about uh, building in systems that learn about changes in the environment and, uh, and have the system adapt to those changes. Okay, so there's many levels of, uh, of many layers of dependability here. And um, uh, in this talk, I will probably talk about only a few of these, in fact, focusing mainly on number one. Um, but there are, uh, there, there are there's a very interesting line of work that combines techniques from formal methods, uh, design automation, cyber physical systems, control theory, programming languages, and so on, that address all of these. And I'm happy to talk to people offline about uh, the things that I know about each of these bullets. OK, so, um, so now in the, uh, in the next few minutes, I want to give you a, a sense of uh, some of the, the problems in this area. So, um, and so problem classes, really. And one of these is uh, robot control and motion planning. Um, and so, uh, I don't know if that video already started playing, but let me go back. Um, and so here, if you, if you squint, you'll see that's, that's a simulation video of a drone flying around a simulated uh, neighborhood, which is pictured over here. 
Okay, and so you may have high level objectives like there's these blue dots, you wanna visit every uh, waypoint, the blue dot, at least once while maintaining a safe distance from obstacles. Um, and now the question is from, from writing a, a high level declarative specification like that, you'd like to be able to synthesize the control sequence for the drone that, that you know, drives it through, that achieves those obstacles, uh, those, those, I'm sorry, those uh, specifications um, uh, in a provably correct fashion, okay? And so that's the problem from a declarative high level spec. How do you synthesize the low level control for the robot so as to meet the specification? Um, one of the, the uses for this is uh, uh, what I'll call real time programmability. So you know, folks in robotics know how to do this already by doing low level programming. But uh, what they'd like to do is raise the level of uh, abstraction to a point where you can write programs, even an end user can write programs uh, in uh, a simple language, and then the compiler, so to speak, takes care of all the, the low level implementation for you while preserving correctness. And you want to be able to do this, so imagine you're, uh, uh, it, there's a, a, you know, a real estate agent who's surveying a property, they'd want to be able to program the drone to do various things at a very high level, um, and then reprogram it on the fly for different properties, right, without having to, to, uh, to deal with the low level details. Okay, so that's, uh, that's one class of problems. Um, another class of problems has to do with verification and monitoring. Um, so in the CPS industry today, uh, especially in safety critical applications, there's a, there's a, a wide use of simulation. Um, um, a lot of it is actually undirected, but increasingly people are using uh, directed simulation where they write uh, their uh, desired properties in a notation uh, that is derived from temporal logic, which is a specification language that's proved quite effective in hardware and software. Um, and, and so what I'm gonna show you here is uh, some use of the simulation-based verification that we have in a lab uh, here at Berkeley in a course, undergraduate course, where uh, the objective of the lab is um, to drive uh, a, a little robot, this is a, a programmable version of the Roomba there, um, to climb a ramp while not falling off and avoiding obstacles and all of that. And um, uh, when we took this class online in a MOOC on edX a few years ago, we designed a virtual simulator, um, which I'll also play here. And uh, this had a built-in auto grading and feedback that was based on uh, simulation-based verification of temporal logic. Now the connection of this to this particular program is that the output of the simulator um, for verification purposes is a, is a, is a time series uh, is data, right? It's a stream of uh, values of the state of uh, the robot and its environment at, uh, at various time points. And you have to be able to monitor the stream, monitor the, pro correct, the, the property, the temporal logic property over the stream and uh, be able to give feedback to the students. Um, and at edX, they told us that you have to be able to provide feedback um, uh, on the order of uh, a, a minute or less, um, otherwise students will tune out, right? So there's this, so it's real time in the sense that if you want to maintain student engagement, you, make sure, you have to make sure that the verification algorithm is actually working fast enough to give them feedback online. Okay, so this is, an, uh, uh, this is a, 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 a class of uh, problems where you, it's related to computing on streams, where what we're doing is monitoring a property over time. And you want to be able to do this with ideally with a constant amount of effort uh, in terms of space and time for every sample. Okay, uh, the final uh, class of applications has to do with security in CPS, uh, particularly secure state estimation um, and secure localization. So the problems here are: imagine that you have a large system with a number of sensors, and many of these sensors are exposed to attackers, and the attacker can actually, you know, physically. Uh, uh, take control of sensors or, you know, or cause them to essentially report bad values uh, which don't meet any fault model. It could be arbitrarily bad. And now the, the goal is you want your control algorithm to be able to detect which sensors were attacked um, and then isolate them and then reconstruct the state using the available uh, good sensors. Right? So that's the secure state estimation problem. In localization, it's a similar situation where the, you may you may be, there may be a robot that's trying to localize itself, but some of the sources of data, like you know, ground stations, might be compromised, and it has to be able to isolate those and then localize itself accurately enough with the remaining. And these have to happen in real time. So hopefully, if there's time permits, I'll show you a little demo of what we've done with the secure state estimation uh, doing this in, in near real time for a drone. 
Okay, so for the rest of the talk, um, my outline is as follows. I want to give a very high level view of the, the challenge in, in CPS, and this is mostly for people who haven't, uh, are not, haven't uh, looked at the field of CPS or hybrid systems before. Um, and then I want to dive into one specific uh, set of techniques that we've been developing over the last couple of years that, that show uh, a lot of promise. This is something we call satisfiability modulo convex programming. Uh, in effect, it's, uh, it's a marriage between SAT solving, which has proved very effective for hardware and software verification, um, and convex optimization, which of course uh, has a number of applications uh, in, in, in a variety of areas. Um, and the class of problems we're looking at actually have characteristics where you need to combine both of these. Um, so I'll spend most of my time talking about that, and then I'll conclude with some future directions. And I just want to mention that uh, the work that I'll talk about today is, is mostly based on a paper that appeared um, about a year ago. Okay. So, uh, so hybrid systems are those that combine discrete and continuous dynamics. So think state machines for the discrete dynamics and uh, differential equations for the continuous dynamics. Um, and uh, and um, over the last uh, two, three decades, there's been a variety of uh, te uh, theory techniques and tools built for design and verification of hybrid systems. And um, one of the big challenges in this area is building reasoning engines that can reason about both discrete variables and continuous variables in high dimension. Okay, so there's two broad classes of, of approaches that people use to, uh, to design and verify these systems. So the first class I'll call abstraction-based techniques. And the idea here is take the continuous part of the system and discretize it. Okay, so you've got your hybrid system, which has your, the red part, which is the discrete part, and the blue part, which is the continuous part. Uh, you uh, essentially take the blue part and carry out uh, uh, some form of, of uh, abstraction to discretize the state space. Then you take the product of the two discrete components and you explore them using existing techniques for, for verification of discrete systems. Okay, there's a variety of techniques for that. Um, the challenge here is that if the continuous part is, is large uh, and complicated, then the corresponding discrete abstraction explodes and then you're not able to do very much. On the other hand, the, there's another class of techniques which are you know, broadly, you can think of them as optimization based, and these go the other way. You take your discrete part of the system and you continuize it, so to speak. So you, you have your hybrid system, you take your discrete system and you encode it um, uh, as in some optimization formulation, um, and then you, you solve that using existing optimization techniques. And, and, and we've done, uh, there's, a, there's a variety of, of uh, work in this area, including uh, some by, uh, by me and Richard and our uh, students, and um, and this does well as long as the discrete side of the system is not too complicated. Okay, so now what to do when you have systems where uh, both the discrete and the continuous part are are complex and high dimensional? Okay, and so that's where we started this work, um, and we thought, well, you know, in the discrete world, SAT solving. Even though this is an NP-complete problem, and in theory, it's, it's known to be a hard problem, in practice, SAT solving is used uh, for a variety of industrial applications routinely, right? And so, um, so that's in a very effective technique for, for reasoning about discrete systems. On the other side, we have convex optimization, which is, a, which is an excellent tool for continuous systems. And so is there a way to combine these two, right? So we're trying to basically build a, a new class of solvers that essentially combine the best of SAT solving with convex optimization. So to motivate this, I'm going to go back to this robot motion planning application. So imagine that you have a robot that's, that starts out at this point, the red star, and it's oriented that way, and it has to get to the blue square, okay? And the black regions are obstacles. Okay, so now the question is, how do I generate a sequence of control actions to drive the robot to the blue square? Um, so uh, a very uh, uh, popular approach is to discretize the, the physical workspace. So you can use your own favorite discretization. So here there's a polygonal tiling that's been shown. And, um, and then you basically, uh, the, the idea here is that each region is designed so that the robot can navigate from any point in this region to any other point, okay? Um, and uh, and there's, there, is a, there is a controller for that. Okay, so, um, so you come up with this with tiling, and you can represent that uh, the, the, the tiled region as a, as a graph, where every region here becomes a node, 
and then you add an edge between two nodes if they share a boundary here. Okay? And so now if I want to get to the blue square, which is pi 28 there, then, it, then you can think of it as a graph reachability problem, right? Um, and I have in particular in this place, in this uh, workspace, I have three routes, one going through the middle, one going that way, and one going this way. Okay? But that's in the discrete world, and not all of these three routes may be feasible when you take the robot dynamics into question. Uh, in particular, it might be that this route, uh, this gap here is too narrow for the, the, the robot to navigate uh, reliably through, and the same thing here. And so in fact, the only feasible uh, route is actually through the middle, okay? And so how do you do that? Well, the idea here is that we want to be able to do some discrete reasoning over this space, and then combine that with some reasoning over the, the continuous dynamics to know which of the, the, the paths in the graph uh, to the, the goal state are actually not feasible. They're not consistent with the, with the dynamics. Okay, so here's uh, one encoding of the problem. Okay, um, we'll, uh, we'll introduce a, a Boolean variable, indicator variable, to, uh, to indicate uh, which region we're at and, and at which time point. So uh, the superscript refers to time and the subscript refers to the region. So at time zero, you are at the start location and at time capital L, you want to get to the goal location, okay? And, um, and then if you're at time J, you're at region I, then at J plus one, you can end up in one of the neighboring regions. Okay, and then at any time point, you're in, only in exactly one of those regions. So those are all Boolean constraints. Then you've got constraints that deal with the robot dynamics. Okay, um, and then finally, you have a constraint that links the two, which says that if at time j I'm in region i, then it must be that the position, the physical position of the robot at time j lies in the polygon corresponding to region i. Okay. So, so that's the sort of problem you end up with. It's a feasibility question where you have a Boolean part, you have a, a, a part which is a conjunction of convex constraints, and then you have a part which mixes the two. All right? Um, now, this is the formulation we had for the robot motion planning question. Um, but when we looked at a, a number of applications, including uh, secure state estimation, we found they all share this uh, common structure, which we call uh, monotone uh, satisfiability modulo convex formulas, which is they really have these, th these, these components. In particular, if you think about the, the overall formula as a circuit, and you push all the negations to the leaves of the circuit, then none of the convex constraints get negated. Okay, that's where the term monotone comes from. Um, and so there's many applications of this, like I mentioned. There's the, the original obstacle avoidance I talked about. Uh, you can do motion planning with temporal logic objectives. You can do motion planning with, with many robots that have to coordinate with each other. Uh, in CPS security, there's a variety of applications, including uh, secure traffic routing, when uh, you have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, and some vehicles are dishonest. Um, but the core technique is, is this thing we call satisfiability modulo convex programming. So let me tell you a little bit about how it works. Um, now, if you think about it at a high level, well, the satisfiability question, the feasibility question for this class of problems is equivalent to the feasibility problem for taking a finite disjunction of convex programs, right? You can just blast this out into disjunctive normal form. Uh, the problem is you don't want to do that because uh, that, will, the, 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 that uh, representation is likely to be exponential. Um, and so the alternative is something that we commonly use in the, the formal methods world, which is to combine a SAT solver with something that reasons about uh, the underlying, uh, um, the variables in your underlying domain. Okay, in this case, it's a convex uh, programming tool. And so the way this works is, we first take our original formula and we separate it into a Boolean part and, uh, and the rest of it. And the way we do that is we add variables, these Boolean variables that correspond to each convex constraint. Okay, so, so in addition to the original B variables, we'll add a new set of A variables. And the, this Booleanized part will be over the A and B variables, <coughs> all right? Um, and, and, uh, and both of these are equi-satisfiable, right? So, and now uh, what we're going to do is we'll take that formula, which is over the, the A and B variables as well as the, the, X, the continuous variables, X variables, and then we combine a SAT solver with a convex programming, uh, a convex solver, um, but the convex solver needs to be able to generate certificates of infeasibility, okay? And so the way the, this works is 
the SAT solver takes just the Booleanized skeleton, it produces a satisfying assignment, and then it passes that over to the convex solver, which will then look at the A variables and pick out all the constraints that correspond to a, the AI is being true, so all the active convex constraints. It'll construct a convex program and try to solve it. If that's feasible, we're done, we have a solution. If it's not feasible, then it has to produce a so-called certificate of uns unsatisfiability, which says, um, uh, you know, what's the reason that convex program was infeasible, okay? And, um, and this process iterates. Um, until uh, un uh, you uh, either report SAT or unsat. Okay, and, and one of the things is that the trivial certificate is simply to take um, the conjunction of all the AIs that corresponding, correspond to the active constraints, and which were found to be infeasible, and just negate them. So you get a clause, which is, uh, which in is the negation of all the corresponding AIs, and you just report that back to the SAT solver and say, don't repeat this convex program again, right? Um, but, but this tends to be, uh, um, you know, uh, have, in practice have a lot of redundant uh, variables in it. And so the whole game here is, in order to be able to solve this, you know, in real time in con for control of a, of a robot, uh, you, you want something that is smart about ruling out these infeasible uh, constraints, okay? And so overall the complexity of the loop is basically the number of iterations of the loop times the time spent in the SAT solver, times the time spent in the convex solver. And even though um, in theory SAT is hard, in practice these SAT problems are, that we've encountered are not too large. And they're, they're, they, they sort of have the, the same form that, um, that the so-called industrial SAT instances have for other applications where it's effective. Okay, and so, so here the, the key is how do you reduce the number of iterations? Um, so f first thing is to note is that um, finding this is NP hard in general, the finding the, the, the minimum, the minimal unsat certificate. Um, but it turns out that the class of problems we're looking at has some interesting structure. Um, and so what I'm showing you on this slide is that um, there's, there's finding an irreducible infeasible certificate which, uh, which will produce the minimal certificate, but um, uh, you know, it, the best we can do right now is exponential time. But here, there's, there's two other techniques we have which, uh, which actually involve just solving either a linear number of convex programs or a constant number of convex programs. Um, and this is the structure that we see in the problems uh, in our domain. Okay, and in particular, let me tell you a little bit about the last one, okay? And I'll just give it through an example. So imagine that this was the graph uh, corresponding to the, uh, the robot motion planning example. Um, each, each circle corresponds to a region which is, is represented by this, uh, this, this set of convex constraints. And imagine that this is the goal uh, region. Um, so let's say your, your, the SAT solver came up with a path to the goal region. You invoked the convex solver to check the feasibility and it came out as being infeasible, okay? Now, um, what we can do is basically find, working backwards, the shortest infeasible prefix. Okay, uh, the general intuition being that, you know, if uh, uh, you have, a, a have a, this particular portion of the path which cannot be executed by the robot, right, it's not consistent with the dynamics, then it doesn't matter what happens before, right? You wanna be able to make sure that you rule that out. You don't, have, you don't come up with an alternative uh, path from the starting state that goes back and tries to repeat this, okay? Um, and so there's a natural order that's imposed by the structure of this graph. Uh, that allows us to extract these uh, infeasible prefixes, okay? And it, in fact, it turns out that um, in uh, thinking about the SAT problem, uh, this ordering constraint imposed from the application uh, defines a subclass of SAT problems uh, that, are, that are called, uh, that, that, that correspond to Boolean formulas that are positively ordered unate, okay? So uh, <laughs> many of you would know what, what positive unate Boolean functions are, which is with respect to a certain variable, if you flip it from zero to a one, then if you had an assignment for the original problem, it remains an assignment for the new one. Um, and in the case of positively ordered unit, uh, there's an ordering in which you flip the variables, okay? And in, in this particular instance, the, the Boolean variables encode which region you're in, and the ordering essentially is, uh, is an ordering derived from uh, essentially a reverse BFS from the gold state. So, um, so anyway, so 
the, uh, the gist of this is that um, uh, you can solve only a convex number of convex, uh, uh, um, constant, uh, con a constant number of convex programs, and, and here are essentially the two convex programs you have to solve to find uh, this certificate, um, and I'll skip the details. Um, let me just show you what you can do with this. So um, in practice, um, you can solve problems that, uh, on the one hand, uh, SAT-based methods are not very good at for exist previous stat based methods are not very good at when you when the number of real variables is large and optimization based tools are not very good at uh, when the number of booleans is large okay so we can get several orders of magnitude speed up uh, we can actually do interesting applications like um, so this is the one i was telling you earlier and maybe i should pause this and just uh, replay um, go back okay so um, so here I'm playing, this is the state estimation where you have two drones. As an, uh, this particular one uh, does, has no protection against the attack, so you see the drone fall down uh, when, uh, when the attack on the IMU is initiated. Okay, and in this case, it's exactly the same trajectory, but, you, but what happens is it just wobbles for a second and then it's able to reconstruct the state using the remaining sensors and then fly. Okay, and so what we're able to do here is essentially run a SAT solver with a convex optimization in a loop that's, that's fast enough that you can do something that looks like real-time control here and being able to isolate uh, attack sensors and recover from it. All right, so I'll conclude now. Um, um, so uh, there's towards uh, being doing correct by construction synthesis of controllers or plans, I think, uh, being able to combine SAT-based methods with, with convex optimization seems to be a really um, promising route, um, including uh, being able to apply this to things like model predictive control. Um, on the verification side, this is not something I talked about, but uh, we have online algorithms for monitoring uh, properties over streams that do essentially a constant amount of work per uh, uh, sample on the stream. And you can use this uh, for monitoring at runtime. Um, we have, uh, you know, there's also work that we have on doing, being able to do this runtime monitoring and then switching between uh, so-called safe and advanced controllers. So imagine you have a, a neural network-based controller that you haven't quite verified and you don't know how to verify exactly, but you have something that is uh, maybe a, 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 a less uh, um, complicated but a more safe and lower performance controller and we can actually do runtime monitoring and then switch between these uh, from the advanced controller to a safe controller uh, so as to uh, to maintain the uh, the robot in a safe uh, operating condition and then there's also some work that we've been doing in in, in using online learning to be able to learn models of the environment um, and then use them for uh, adaptation um, and uh, also uh, taking uh, algorithms for clustering and lift them to the logical level so that um, you can you could monitor uh, data streams um, and and then do unsupervised learning over them to to identify clusters, but then also give the clusters labels as logical formulas so that you can use those logical formulas in in designing controllers for the for the environments that are characterized by this data. Okay, so I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions if there is time. Uh, and I'm I'm around at, at Berkeley and in the program, uh, so happy to talk to you um, offline as well. Thank you. Right. So, I, so uh, the question is, what do you do when you have an advanced controller where uh, uh, you may not be able to verify yeah. its correct operation? Okay. So, so the, the the typical thing one does is you construct a um, conservative abstraction of what this advanced controller does, and that gives you a safety envelope. Right? So you know that the, maybe the controller is actually going to be safe, but you conservatively assume that it's that it may uh, do something unsafe. It may violate the safety specification. And then at that point, you switch to the safe controller. 
So um, my question is actually uh, related. So it seems that you need to know the uh, state accurately for this to work. Yeah, so right. Suppose that the state estimate is noisy. Yeah. And for example, in a robotic path printing problem, yes. the robot would think it's in one region, but right. it's in another. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's okay. What so, uh, so I have to say, I mean, that's your ex the question was, uh, you know, what happens when you combine. Uh, partial ob observability or noisy sensor data, right? noisy state estimates, with doing, having to do something like this. right? And the, I, at this point, I don't have a good answer to this. right? So we can do this when, we have, when the sensors are assumed to be perfect and we have full observability of the system, okay? right? which doesn't hold in practice. And then we have some solutions for dealing with the case where um, you, you may have a verified controller, but then you have uh, noisy or faulty sensors, right? But now combining these two, I think, is an open problem. Okay, that's, I guess, all the speakers here.